as you're probably aware, um, if you come regularly, you'll be aware, but if you're a visitor, you won't be aware that we're currently going through and restating the, the, uh, the vision of the church and what we're trying to achieve, what the elders would like us to achieve, where we're going, what that looks like. And um, the first week we talked about, the first two weeks we talked about worship. Then three, two weeks ago I talked about impact. And what that means. And then Jeremy talked last week. And this week we're also going to be looking at impacts part two. If you've, um, if you've not got the card, one of these cards that, that's on the welcome desk, it basically states what our vision is. It's um, worshipping, value, rooted, and impact. If you've not got one of these, please go and get one. It tells you some more detail on there. Uh, put it on your... I've seen it on people's fridges and other places already, so that's really good. But it's just a, an easy way to remember what we're doing and why we're doing it. And to supplement that, we are writing at the moment a series of uh, leaflets. Uh, this is the uh, first one you're going to get. Uh, we missed the worship one because I had Christmas in between and missed it. Um, but this is the first one. The next one, when we're doing uh, values next week, you'll get a new one. But on here has all the things that currently, as far as I'm aware, corporately, and please forgive me if I've missed something, or we have missed something, what we're up to and what we're about. Okay? It's to try to communicate some of the things that we are practically doing in our community to make an impact and try to help you understand some of the things and processes that we go through to join some of those dots all together. And if you want some more of these, that's great. We're also putting these out in the hub so that when people come into the hub and they don't know who Kings is, but they're just borrowing the building, they get some information about what we're up to and what we're trying to achieve. Now, um, a couple of weeks ago, we went to the first, the premier Allerdale Expo, okay? And we handed some of these out, so you're not the first people to get them. So I'm so sorry about that. But social services, NHS, all sorts of people have got copies of this as things that we're doing. And interestingly enough, you get people like um, things I never even thought about. But um, the, the, a woman came to talk to me. She is the head of, I don't know what the word is, but getting people out of beds into, back into the community. Sorry? Reablement. And one of the problems is when they're re-enabling people to get back into the community, they've been in the hospital for a while, they're looking at all sorts of social structures that help them. And she looked at this and said, oh, you do all these things. We can, we can plug into some of this with some of the people that we need to get back out into society, into community. What an awesome possibility. I had coffee this week with um, a girl. She's, she works for West House. Um, very interesting conversation about how we can, uh, or they support people with special needs in work and exploring how can we fit into that somehow. What does that mean for us? Can we use opportunities like Sunday lunch to um, incorporate and help supported working with people with special needs? All sorts of things. On the back, oh sorry, in the middle you've also got the sort of events that we do as a church and churches together to impact our community and then Right at the back, the very back, it says anything else. Well, these are some of the other organisations that either we're working with or have grown out of what we're doing. Okay, things that are going on. We can celebrate all this this morning, but we're not going to. Okay, because this is the foothills of impact in our community. Okay, this is just the foothills. I want to um, recommend a book to you. Okay. I'm in the middle of reading this book, and I'm finding it quite hard to put down. It's not a difficult read in terms of the words. It's an incredibly difficult read in terms of the content. And it's called Poverty Safari. It's not a Christian book. It has words in it which will make you blush. <laughs> okay? It has comments and phrases that are really quite difficult to... You go, oh. It strongly, strongly argues against my politics. Okay? It is a, I find it a really difficult read. 
But it's by a man called Darren McGarvey. He lived in Scotland, or lived, he was brought up in Scotland, in the Gorbals. And he's talking about poverty in our society today. Poverty is a massive, massive issue in our, in our communities. We live with rural poverty a lot. If you think about rural poverty for a second, and it's not about money, it's about people, for example, an old person in a village, has no car, no bus. How do you get in and out? How do you go and get your food shopping? Well, you get a taxi. Taxis are expensive. What happens when it snows and you can't get out? Rural poverty. Um, I grew up with a, um, in a situation in a pit village in South Yorkshire. Um, if you've ever seen Kez, has anybody seen Kez? Put your hands up if you've seen Kez. The rest of you, go and watch it. Okay? It has words and it will make you blush, but it's all right. Okay, that's, that was the, uh, the village, next village to me was Kez, where that was shot. It was a kind of poverty in a different way. We didn't know we were in poverty, but that's what it was. And he explores in this book the whole questions of things like uh, people in prison, alcoholism, drug abuse. Why do people get to where they get to? And he asked the question, what are we going to do about it? <coughs> where are we going to find the answers? Our politicians increasingly find it very difficult to find answers to the questions that have been raised in our society. And I also don't like this book because it makes me out to be middle class. And I am. And I don't like it. Okay, because it starts to question some of my, um, some of the structures that I've placed around myself to protect me from society that's out there that I don't like. If you want to wake up to what's going on in our country right now, this is a stunningly good book. Okay, you won't find it in the Christian bookshop. But please, if you're interested, please go and get a copy of it. Okay, and be shocked. Last, uh, two weeks ago, we were talking about Impact One, and Lucy helpfully um, went through the whole of Psalm 107. I'm not going to rehearse it now. I'm just reminding you what we talked about, about how people find themselves in the situations they find themselves in. They find themselves in situations not sometimes entirely by circumstance. Sometimes they find themselves in, that's the way they were born in this, into this. It's just the way it was, it's the way it is, it's the way it's going to be forever. It's a circumstance. Some people find themselves in their circumstances because of ill health. Suddenly, out of the blue, weren't expecting it. Bam, life's changed forever. And find themselves in difficult situations because of things that have happened to them that is not their fault. It is just life. It's illness. Or they find themselves in a situation where they're in circumstances because something happened to them that was out of their control. Redundancy. Something awful happens. Their, their work's closed down and suddenly I find myself in a difficult situation. And we have to face the fact that sometimes people find themselves in circumstances because they make the wrong decisions. Sometimes we make foolish decisions. And Lucy helpfully took us through that. If you could put the slide on with Thomas Merton, and she put this up here for us. This is Thomas Merton. Our job is to love others without stopping to inquire whether or not they're worthy. Now I want you to know that I've had to work through that really hard. At the risk of being pilloried by Andy Graham, I used to be an Daily Mail reader, okay? And the question of worthiness and whether people deserved what they got is a big issue in right-wing newspapers. I don't read it anymore, okay? Just so you know. Yes, yes I'm a Telegraph reader now. Um, our job is to love others without stopping to think or inquire whether or not they are worthy, whether or not they deserve it. 
And then I looked, if you remember, at the parable of the mustard seed and how God's kingdom comes, and it's a small thing, and it grows into a huge thing, and that it's a place, should be a place of safety for people who are not yet part of the kingdom. The church, not King's Church, but the church, should be the safest place on earth for people who are in difficult circumstances. And yet, it's not. And yet it's not. It should be the place where, see, 1945, just after the war, um, and and Ira and Bevan set up the health system and social care. What happened was that many, um, many of the political people at the time, they looked at what the church was doing and they took it over. They said, well, we can do this. Society should do this. And I remember being brought up in the 60s and 70s where actually there's a culture that, that the government, society, owes me what I get. Right? Society gives me everything. The truth is now that that's changing because bit by bit, the government is cutting things back and back and back and back. Finance is going out of the system. And as finance goes out of the system, the, the structures that are built around it, the NHS, the government, the uh, Allerdale Council, uh, Cumberland Co- Cumbria County Council, all sorts of organisations that were built around that are slowly finding themselves in a situation where the money's getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. So just recently, um, I don't know if you're aware, but if you just take the small area of addictions, whether that's drug or alcohol addiction, but discretionary funding for drug and alcohol addiction is being withdrawn. Which means that people who have drug and alcohol addictions are finding it harder and harder to access service to help them through that situation. It's getting harder. A couple came into the church a few weeks ago. I'm not going to name them. They're not part of the church. They're on universal credit. Okay? And they came into the church building because they needed food. Their universal credit used to come over in a fortnight, and they could cope with that, and then it's moved to four weeks, and the government is asking them to live on the same amount of money, well, not the same, obviously four weeks' worth of money, but over a four-week period. Now, in my mind, budgeting over a four-week period, a two-week period, is, is not a big jump. But for many people, it is. And they came into the church, looking for, into church building, looking for food, and they did it once, and they've done it several times, and so we started a conversation with them. And it turns out that their next payment at that time was due two weeks away and they had 25 pence left in their bank balance. This is in Cockermouth. Now, I'm not making political statements. Please do not hear behind anything I'm saying, politics. What I'm saying is there are people out there who are desperately needing help and desperately needing security. And as the government withdraws through its political decisions, there's a vacuum arising behind which what happens? The church should be the safest place on earth for people in poverty to access security, safety, and Food, finance, care, love. What I've sought to do over this last, well, the last one, and then Jeremy helpfully in the middle restating exactly what I was saying the week before, is that as a church, as part of our impact into communities, to look for opportunity not to grow King's Church, but to bless people. One follows the other. Whether Kings grows or not, 
is irrelevant to the fact that people need help and security. It's irrelevant. Whether we look good or not is irrelevant. Whether somehow we get all applauded it's, is irrelevant. It's not, it's, I'm not interested. What I am interested in is, what do I do for that couple who've got 25 pence in their bank balance right now? What do I do? Where do we go? And it means having to face some big questions. Because if one person comes in that situation, that's one thing. But if 20 people come in in that situation, that's a, an entirely different matter. But I want you to know that there's not a week goes by now without somebody coming to the church building who's looking for food. They've come from the food bank or they're going to the food bank. They're just looking for food. It happens pretty much every week in some form or other. That's why I say this is just the foothills of where we're going. It's just a start. We can look at um, international situations, and later on in the year, um, Maz and Debbie are going to be running in Rwanda, and we're going to give time to that later in the year. Internationally, how do we impact communities is really important. We're not going to miss that out. Nationally, how we do that is important, and we're not going to miss that out. But this morning, I want to look particularly at local and county level. That's where I'm, I'm going to sharpen everything down. How do we do this? Massive, massive thing. Could we have the next slide up? Well, here's some of the words that are on that vision statement card. Grace. We do it with grace. Not with arrogance. Not with thinking that we've got all the answers, because we haven't. Grace means that I get what I don't deserve, and I don't get what I do deserve. Grace means that when somebody comes in, somebody comes to talk to us about something, we, we do it in a way which gives them dignity, and it gives them a platform to work off, that they know that they're loved and cared for, that it doesn't matter. Grace overlooks. It overlooks all the things that, in my, I said to you a couple of weeks ago, I have a tick box that goes in my mind quite frequently, and I'm trying desperately to get rid of it, but it's been ingrained in me for 57 years. But grace overlooks the tick box to see the person. Jesus didn't go through a tick box when he saved me. Thank goodness that he didn't look at me in terms of, well, Paul could be this, 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 and this in the kingdom so he can come in. That's not part of Jesus' thinking. He brings grace to us. He brings grace to me. We do it through love. Love is such a banded word round, and we come up to Valentine's Day. I hate Valentine's Day. I'll let you into a little secret. Lorraine and I have never, ever, in 35 years, celebrated Valentine's Day together. I told her I loved her when I got married. If it changes, I'll tell her again. <laughs> well, is that not right? All right, okay. <laughs> Anybody who wants marriage guidance counsel, come to us. We'll sort you out, okay? I hate Valentine's Day. Love is such a cheap word. It's a cheap expression. True love says, I'm going to walk this path with you, wherever it goes. Whatever the bumps are, whatever the, the detours we have to take to get there, whatever the arguments on the way, whatever the things that we have to cope with together, it's about a deep commitment to what we're doing. It's much more than with the word that we're banding around. But we, as a church community, we should learn about love. Going the nth degree, going the next step, going beyond what we think. It's 
about good news. Impacting our community is about good news, bringing good news to people. And the good news is this. Yes, the, the overarching good news is that Jesus loves you and he wants you to be part of his kingdom, but the overarching good news is this. There is hope for you. There is a future for you. There is something beyond where you're at which is better than you've got. The good news is this, that you are unique and really, really special and you're important. There are kids today that never hear those words. We should be bringers of good news. Whatever that looks like for that person in that situation right now. We bring hope. There is a better tomorrow. There can be a better tomorrow. There can be a future for you in your situation, whatever that situation is. And we should be looking at how we do this through community, not lone rangers. Community is really important. Our community is important. The community of the church is important. The community of Cockmouth and surrounding areas of Cumbria is important. We do this in community. I'm learning more and more about partnership. What does that look like? And partnering with some people that I would, in the past, never thought of partnering with. I'm going to come on to that in a minute. Bob and Jean are just going to come and take the edge off my voice for a bit. Is that all right? Do we have another hand held, or is this it? So Bob and Jean, they've um, agreed to be interviewed. Is that all right? If you want to come this way, and then the, 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 uh, the light's not in your eyes, Bob. Or is it coming out of your eyes? I can't tell. There you go. So I thought I'd... <clears throat> we're going to look at... From here on in, I've given you the platform for how and why and everything else. Now we're going to look at some detail and how we get involved in things that perhaps we were surprised about. So, Bob, tell me what it is that you have been involved with for the last eight years or so. Okay, it's money advice and debt advice. Money <coughs> advice and debt advice. And how did you get into that? Well, it's a long story. <coughs> it's a long story. It was about 20 years ago, God gave me this vision that he wanted me to help people in financial difficulties. But it, did, it took eight, no, it took 12 years to get that off the ground. Um, and I had to be patient in those 12 years uh, from when God gave me that vision to actually getting it off the ground. And it was hard, hard work. But eventually we got a team together and we started the work. And what's it called? West Cumbria Community Money Advice. And what do you do? We uh, help people that have got debt problems uh, to solve those debt problems and help them get free from debt. We also help people who are finding it difficult to manage, especially with people going on to universal credit. So we help them with their budgets and help them manage to get out of debt. What's the, um, the greatest joys that you get from it? The joys are when people have actually made that effort to come and see us. That's the hardest thing, to get them over the threshold, to admit that they've got a problem. And then the joy is when we've had that first meeting with them and we've said we can help. And you see the, all the pressure drift away from them. And they go out from that first meeting relieved and with full of joy. And what's the worst bit of it? <laughs> the worst bit is well there is no worst bit really because we've able to help we say to people whatever their problem there is an answer it might take a long while to get them out of debt but there is a light at the end of the tunnel um, so we try and give people hope that if they stick to the plans that we arrange with them there is hope at the end Jean, that's not your story, is it? No. <laughs> um, I kind of fell into this by accident, um, mainly because I'm married to Bob. And when I, <laughs> when I retired, and um, after the initial um, 
euphoria of not having to go to work every day, I suddenly realised I was going to have to do something or I might just, you know, fade away. So um, Bob was in the process of getting this set up and I went along with him to help with the training days and did the training and started, started helping people. And as I look back now... I realised that I've probably always wanted to help people sort themselves out. Now, that can sound quite arrogant, that I know best, but I don't. I'm, um, if you like ironing, like I do, um, you like making things smooth. You like getting rid of the creases. You like making it all right. And I think that's, that's part of me. And that's what I want to help other people do, is get their muddle, get their mess, and somehow untangle it and, um, and make it come right. So I got into this by accident and initially I found it really hard. Some of the things Paul said already, you know, I was, I suddenly found that I was middle class and I'd grown up in the East End of London and I have also the honour of being an Essex girl. <laughs> and, uh, and I suddenly found that people thought I was posh and they thought I got it all sorted, but I haven't. And what I've I've just seen that 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 God has somehow used the situation to show me more about how I should be when I'm dealing with people. So we've been doing this for eight years, and I feel I'm still learning. Not so much about how to deliver the money advice, because for me that's quite easy. It's a series of tick boxes, and you do this, and this will happen. But people aren't like that. People are very messy. And um, God is just showing me how he deals with people and he's dealing with me in doing that. So what qualifies you to do this job? What qualifies me to do this job? Loving people, I think, basically. Um, you've got to love people. You've got to want them to have the very best that there is. And, I mean, ultimately, that's to know Jesus. And if, in their present circumstance, their problem is financial... It's to start where they are and use the opportunities that we get to share Jesus with them. Okay, just to close, Bob, you um, gave us some figures the other night about how much debt there is that we're dealing with right now. You remember what those were? I think it's... Um, we've done about 80 people since we started with debts of just under a million. Um, at the present time, we're dealing with 27 live cases with a debt of about 300-odd thousand. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, June. So I talked about partnerships a minute ago, and partnerships are becoming really important. So we've, in the past few months and years, I've started partnering with, partnering with people like the Rotary Club, and the Women's Institute, and others. Because we don't have all the answers, we have some of them, and the other organizations have other bits of the answers that we can work with. We're foolish if we think that we've got everything here. That would just be foolish. One of the very critical partnerships that we've forged that you may not be aware of is with Cumbria County Council. Now, over, since I've arrived in four years, the first year I was here, I wondered what on earth I was doing here. I'll be honest. Some of you wondered the same question. <laughs> four years on, I'm still asking the same, what on earth am I doing here? And then the flood happened in 2015. And the result of that was that I met some very, very interesting and helpful people. And I'm going to introduce you to a lady in, the, in a second called Haley, Haley Bishop. She works for... Cumbria County Council, and uh, Haley and I have forged uh, a really good friendship, I hope, I think. She's my only friend. <laughs> but equally, you may not realize it, but Haley's a really good friend of King's. Okay, and I say that with all honesty. Um, Haley and I talk about lots of different issues. We're involved together in food banks, uh, not food banks, fair share. Um, 
We've been involved in youth work, we've been involved in children's work, we've been involved in dementia work, we've all sorts of things we've started to do partnering together. Some of which is bearing fruit in here. So I've asked Haley to come along this morning. In, she's, um, she's come with fear and trepidation, okay? So be nice to her, play nicely, okay? But Haley's going to take the next 10 minutes or so just telling us about where the county is in terms of its social action projects and how it views life in social policy, okay? And I'm doing that for a, a reason. One is that we're in partnership with them, but secondly, I want you to lift your eyes to see the issues that are bouncing around and some of the solutions that county council are coming up with that we can partner with in different ways, okay? Is that all right? Yes. So would you welcome Haley for me, please? Thank you. I'm quite nervous about this. I'm hoping... Um, yeah, I think Paul's mentioned a lot of what we do um, already and about the importance of linking with community organisations, with communities, and how we can, we can kind of help each other. Um, he did sort of say to me at the start, please don't sing sort of Kings' um, praises, but I, I need to a bit, really. Um, we've done some fantastic... You do some fantastic work... Um, I sing your praises to all organisations. Paul talked about the expo. Um, we held a community asset expo recently at West Cumbria House where um, this came from discussions with reablement, social services, children's services, and it was quite apparent that there was loads of good projects out in the community that people weren't aware of. And what we're trying to do is sort of reduce the demand on these services because, as, as we know, the cost to us money... Um, and they are, our budgets are decreasing. So we held an expo, there's about 54 organisations came, King's was one of those, and we had about 270 people come to talk to a variety of people from Healthy Hopes, Together We, King's Church, etc., to learn about all the good stuff that was going on in the community. And we had people sort of from housing associations, our social workers, the police, etc., just to share good practice and to educate people in what's going on in the communities. So I think a lot of what's on my slides, Paul's already sort of talked about, but I'll try and kind of go through from a county perspective about how we work in our team. So looking at public health within the county council now, I apologise if I have to turn around because I'm not very good at remembering all this off the top of my head. Um, from a public health point of view, we look at what makes the person healthy. So if you look at the little man on the, the left-hand side, only 10% of what makes us healthy is our genetics. Then we have 10% is access to health services, 40% is the lifestyle we lead, and then 40% is the social and economic um, side of our lives. So it's not just about access to health services. From the three areas that we're looking at from... Um, the county council we've got the health protection there's a lot of prevention stuff we look at and we work on health improvement and then population health care quality with the big challenges in Cumbria being an aging population we're actually a super aging population um, which causes some co sort of concerns further down the line with regards to budgets because we are an older population um, mental health these these sort of four challenges, we look at what the statistics are and where we're kind of over the national average and things that we need to look at. And health inequalities, we've got massive issues where we've got um, deprivation really sort of quite closely to quite affluent areas in quite a short sort of distance. And then children and young people, what we can do, we've got sort of a larger... Um, percentage of young smokers so that's one of the issues that we we're looking to tackle this just sets us out about the the council priorities um i won't bore you with reading those but they're, they're the kind of the focus that the council um has picked out as their their key priorities And then with regards to drilling down into Aladau, these are the, the health and wellbeing priorities in Aladau. So going back um, to 
ageing well in Allerdale, healthy attitudes towards alcohol, mental well-being, obesity including healthy weights in children and reducing smoking levels of smoking and harm caused by smoking. And all of these priorities come from where we are higher than the national average in these areas and we have issues in these areas. So when we look at what we can do to help people, we don't just look at the single items, we look at what the, something called the wider determinants of health. Um, and we recognise that it isn't just one factor. So where Paul talks about um, the money advice, that kind of comes in, if, you, if you're struggling with your money, that might increase you to look at, say, alcohol or smoking. It might affect your mental well-being. So it's more than just the one issue. So when we look at improving people's lifestyles, we need to look at the wider determinants, and it's not just about the one issue. Not sure how much you can see with that. So I'm going to talk to you a bit about how we get involved with things um, at work. So I'm a, I've missed that back out completely. I'm a community development officer at the county council. So what we do is we look at where the needs are in the communities and we work with organisations to fill a gap. So at the moment, one example is we hold a quarterly children and young people partnership group where we have the likes of... Um, the youth providers, um, Cumbria Youth Alliance, and a variety of different people come along to a meeting. And at the meeting last week, we were talking around what, 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 are, the, what are the current issues for young people. And one of the things that was identified is that there's, there's a bit of a, um, a lack of support from transitioning between school and college. There's quite a lot of support around if somebody's going on the path from sort of school to to college, to university, but for those that are maybe struggling with that, that pathway, there's not that much that supports people once they leave, that, they leave with their GCSEs and they find themselves sort of classed as NEAT, which is not in employment educational training. So as a partnership, what we're going to look at is what services are out there that can provide support for these young people and what the gaps are. And hopefully we can form some kind of support service that fills that gap and reduces that number of people that find themselves in, in that transition period that, who are struggling. There's other things that we, we look at. Um, Paul's mentioned we work with the WI. They do, they've done some cookery sessions in Cockermouth. Um, the Cockermouth Emergency Response Group, I've been linked into that from, from sort of day one because I was quite heavily involved in the recovery stages of, of the flooding. Um, that kind of increases community resilience. There's a, there's a lot of people that needed that, that little bit of support and guidance, and hopefully we've replicated that in Workington um, as well. So hopefully we're providing a bit of support there. Um, with regards to in the libraries, we're trying to utilise the libraries to become more of community hubs. Um, so with the success of an organisation called Huggermug in Maryport, I don't know if anybody's aware of that, they found that 30% of people that phone in or take appointments up with the doctors haven't got anything clinically wrong with them. And a lot of that was around social isolation and just having somebody to talk to. So in Maryport, at Umerick, local trust set up an organisation called Huggermug, and that's running really successfully at the moment. And I know that there's been something similar set up in Cockham of Surgery, and we've just recently set one up in more close library called Maritime. Um, Breastfeeding and peer support group, one of the issues around um, the uptake with breastfeeding in Allerdale was quite low. So we've looked at support groups for, for, for parents and, and breastfeeding mums, and we've just recently set that off in Seaton Library. Dementia Action Alliances, um, we've set up Dementia Action Alliances across some of the towns um, in Allerdale. And that's, again, linked in with the super-aging population. We're looking at dementia-friendly communities and what we can do to help those that are living with dementia and to keep them safe and independent for as long as possible. And out of some of that have come the dementia cafes. Um, there's a church in Maryport who does um, a dementia-friendly service where they do a short service and looking at sort of all the old traditional hymns, etc. And we, we've run, some of the alliances have run sort of tea dances, which has been quite popular as well. So there's quite a lot of bits and pieces going on. Um, the money advice, Paul's touched on that. And again, it, that kind of feeds through and that can lead to other issues um, with regards to sort of mental health, etc. So it's really key 
to sort of look at all different aspects of people's um, issues. Sorry, I'm blurring a bit now. <laughs> uh, yeah, so some of the examples of what we've been looking at. Down in um, Barrow, there's a really, really um, successful lunch club, intergenerational lunch club, where Age UK take um, a busload of sort of older adults into a school and they lunch together on a weekly basis and that's working really well and that's something that we'd like to look at in in our area as well so that's something that's on our our kind of radar health and well-being sessions we work with an organized organization called together we um, they ran a predominantly sort of female gym membership and they were looking to expand but they weren't quite sure who to speak to with regards to sort of moving that on. So with the support of my colleague in Workington, they've now linked in with the, the ICCs, the Integrated Care Community Hubs. Um, they're working with CYA with the, on the Emotional Resilience Project. So they go into schools and they, they speak to young people about their emotional resilience. They've got a program about that. And they've also recently got a contract through the ICCs around um, health and wellbeing for people with diabetes. So just with a little bit of support, we don't do the work, but what we do is we sort of, it's a bit of a jigsaw, we introduce people to other people to then support them. Um, food pantries, as Paul's probably spoken to you about before, um, the food banks do a fam fabulous job in the areas, but sometimes that's a bit restricted with the amount of times that people can visit those with the, the amount of vouchers they get from the crises. Um, so what we've done is we've worked with Fair Share and... Um, I've worked more so with the one in Maryport, so at the settlement, they've got a monthly food pantry, which people can come in and, and take food, it's not restricted. But what we also want to do is trying to put in the likes of the money advice, um, we can get community learning and skills, which is at the county council, they run employability, confidence and communication courses, and link in other support services. So it's not just about taking the food, it's about what else can we help people with. And the other thing is, with, with working with, say, for example, the gardening clubs I've put up there, Reablement, um, who somebody mentioned earlier, came to us and said, oh, they've got this person, they really like gardening, what can we do? So by linking in with one of the community organisations in Maryport, we've actually got him going and volunteering in that setting and doing a bit of, of gardening. So we try to... It's kind of a, a person-centred a person approach. It's not about... Um, what's available, it's about what we can do. So with regards to daycare, um, people that go into daycare, it might not be, they might not want to go and play bingo or do some arts crafts. They might want to go and do a bit of gardening, they might want to do walking football, for example, that's something that's come out of um, Cumberland Football Association, have been working around linking in with the dementia, and they've recently got a, a walking football session starting up at Cockham of Leisure Centre. So it's about the, the person, the, pers the, the person, the individual, and what we can do for them, rather than trying to fit them into statutory services that might not might not fill their needs. So looking at the positive outcomes, hopefully by by working in this way, we can reduce social isolation and loneliness, promote independence, influence change by educating outcomes on health and well-being to ensure that they make people make li wiser lifestyle choices, educate and confidence build in partnership working. As, as Paul said, we can't do it on our own. Um, we have statutory sort of services, but we c it's not person-centred, and there's far more that we can do with working in partnership. Provide an effect on efficient services, provide an effective and efficient services, and also social return on investment. So one of, the, one of the campaigns we run is the Falls Prevention Campaign, which is around the third week in September. So we go out and speak to people about how they can be steady on their feet. Um, Age UK do these sort of up and about chair-based exercises. We talk to people about have they had their eyes tested recently, other medications, right, etc. And just what, simple ways that they can think about how to, to keep safe and steady. We also do what they call a slipper exchange. Um, so anyone who hasn't got sort of secure slippers, we've got free slippers that we can swap about. And that links in with the, the prevention side because it costs around £20,000 for a hip fracture. That's the cost to the NHS and the, the, the sort of the health services. And obviously with regards to if we can keep people safe and healthy, 
the impact is it should reduce the cost to sort of adult social care and statutory services further down the line. So <laughs> I think I've exhausted myself now. Um, so yeah, that's and and linking in with third sector community organisations is key. As I said, we can't do this on our own. Um, there's some fabulous work already out there, and we just want to continue to push and work with people to to make the health and well-being of people in Allerdale better. Right, thank you. You see, we can set up programmes, okay, and ask you to come and join our programmes, and that's, that's justifiable, it's good. But I want you to see that there's lots of other programmes out in, in society and community that you can go and join, you can get involved in. It doesn't have to be kings and kings alone. Is that all right to say that, Roger? It's not just kings and kings alone. There's all sorts of things. You, who likes gardening? Why not? Could you link some people into what you're doing, some of that support? I'm starting a sit-watching football club. Okay? Right. So, there are other things. I want to uh, just commend Richard Barber where is he here somewhere, he was here, who, to my surprise, popped up in the Times and Star. Okay, and I thought, oh, there's Richard Barber, there's a photograph. And it turns out he's become a parish councillor in Brigham. Have you thought of becoming a parish councillor? Or a local councillor, town councillor, a county council councillor? Okay, have you thought about it? Perhaps, like me, because I am interested in politics, actually, sometimes we've got to be involved in politics to get the changes we want. Perhaps you need to do that. Or perhaps you need to be like uh, Patrick. Patrick, um, about a year ago, I conned him to becoming a school governor at Paddle. No, I didn't con him, I encouraged him. Do we have any other school governors? To Haley. Have you thought about becoming a school governor? Are you concerned about your school? Are you concerned about the school that your kids go to? Are you concerned about the things they teach or the things that they do? Or perhaps you just want to get involved in your school? Just think about it. Go and be a governor. Where's Lynn? Lynn's not here. Is Lynn here? Lynn's here. She's the Chairperson of the Cockermouth School and Community Association, B&Q, M&Ms, B&Ms, whatever. Okay? What a great opportunity to serve our community. She was here this week making teas and coffees while they watched the um, hairspray. Have you thought about doing that? There's all sorts... The church in the past has become fixed on doing certain things at certain times to support certain people. We sang spirit break out, break our walls down. We need to be very creative in thinking about how can we engage and impact our local community. I'm going to fostering. As you know, that Lorraine and I are now foster parents. We have been on and off for years. We're also adoptive parents. There are other foster parents here. Maybe the thought of taking a child into your home is absolutely massive. I want to tell you it is absolutely massive. <laughs> okay? At 57, I never thought I'd be doing some of the things I'm doing now. But listen, maybe fostering is a huge step for you. You think, no, I couldn't possibly do that. That's so far down the line. But what about getting engaged with safer homes? or home for good? What about getting involved in some mentoring with some families that actually, to be honest, if they don't get mentoring, they're going to end up looking for foster parents? Have you thought about just talking to other mothers? Some of you older women, the Bible's very clear. It says in, in Timothy, I think it's Timothy, older women, speak to the younger women. Teach them. 
Older men, speak to younger men, teach them. Our society is so, dis- so dysfunctional in so many ways that families are, you know, young families, young girls with, and young men, with, uh, young parents with kids, with grandparents that live 300 miles away, looking for help because they don't know how to do what they're doing. They're just looking for help. I'm going to finish in about two or three minutes, so don't worry. But I'm going to finish with a bit of a punch. Is that all right? Is that okay if I punch you? I went to um, a seminar about two weeks ago. And when I came to this book, it it's brought back some of that stuff. But the seminar was punctually called Suicide and Self-Harming in Young People. Who would like to go to a course like that? It is hard work. In that course, there's a video of a young girl, and her words have etched into the back of my brain, and I don't know how to get rid of them. It's a girl who's self-harming, and she was talking about being completely dissociated from all her feelings. She was talking about how she could not emotionally express herself because of the things that she'd been through. She couldn't, she had not got the words to tell people what she was feeling inside. So she started self-harming. And she was asked the question, well, how do you express your emotions? And she said these words, she put them on the screen. My blood is my tears. That landed so deep. And I don't know what to do about it. We come across kids in the work we're doing that are in this situation. So I've asked Becca to come and be interviewed because I don't... I, Becca is working... Well, we'll come to that in a second. But there are, even in that situation, there are things that we can look at and hope for. Okay, because the gospel has got answers, but it just sometimes takes years and years and years to work out. The church should be a safe place, but when we go somewhere, we are the church. Becca, what do you do for a living? Or what do you do sometimes for for a living? Um, I work for a small charity based in Whitehaven called Whitehaven Community Trust. What they have is two hostels. They have a hostel for um, homeless 16 to 24 year olds who all come in with very complex needs. And we also have a mum and baby hostel. So what I do is I work there from two o'clock till 11 o'clock at night with a group of young people, could be 10 in the house, and I work by myself. I'm alone in that house with all of those young people with those very complex needs. And what sort of needs do they present to you? Are you allowed to say? Without getting anything away? (laughs) You name it, you name it. Um, Obviously housing needs, relationship needs, um, mental health needs, um, basic needs such as food, clothing, um, you name it, you name it. The majority of them, you could say, has every single one of the needs. And how do they express themselves to you? What sort of, how do they express what they're feeling inside? Um, generally, they will express what they're feeling inside with their behaviour, particularly when they first come into us. Now, the behavior can be anywhere on a scale of acting out behavior. It can be not trusting, it can be anger, it can be health, self-harming. Um, we have had quite a few suicide attempts over the last few months, which are very hard 
on the staff and on the individuals as well, particularly when you're working there by yourself. Um, and you're out there by yourself. How do you think King's Church could support you in that? Support me as an individual or the organisation? I think King's Church do support me as an individual. Um, the, the group that Maz set up, the, the church at work, um, I'm in a WhatsApp group with some people, and if there is anything that I need or anything praying with, they got me through a very difficult situation. I think it was just before Christmas. That was absolutely transformed um, because of prayer. There are other <laughs> basic needs. Um, Paul very kindly brings some things to me from the Fair Share Scheme, which is wonderful. And, I mean, this week I took into a hostel of young people pineapples, whole pineapples. Now, that seems pretty strange, but the whole experience of having a relationship with these young people over having to cut a whole pineapple it was more than just the food. It was the experience. They hadn't seen whole pineapples before, let alone eaten them and done anything with them. That was quite incredible. Um, it's all sorts of things. I mean, last night I, I was working, about 10 o'clock last night, I had five young people that came in the office with me. They don't have to come in the office. They have communal spaces. They came in the office. Okay, I was giving out tea and I was giving them out some cocoa pop bars that had come from the fair share scheme. One of the girls, I asked her if she wanted a cup of tea. This is a girl who has, she's 17. She's been in, let me think, October. She came out of a children's psychiatric unit and she'd been in there for about eight months. She had a chaotic life before that. Do you know what she loved? The fact that I was willing to put six cups, six teaspoons of sugar in a cup of tea because she hasn't got enough money to buy sugar. For me, it's a privilege. I love working there. I love these people. And it is about love, but sometimes it's really hard too. And I've probably not answered your question. I can talk about this forever and not answer your question. I know you could. <laughs> I know you could. That's why John's deaf. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, okay. Just one question. What, what are, again, the question is, what sort of joys and what, what, what gives you deep joy when you work in there? Oh, do you know, the deep joy is often in the very smallest moments, the very smallest breakthroughs you get of somebody that hasn't trusted you or anybody else forever, and you get some eye contact with them. And as simple as that. Simple as that. Thank you. Tiny breakthroughs. Thank you. We're going we're gonna to close. Last week, Jeremy was talking about extending our tent, putting out the sticks, getting some cords that would hold them down. Okay, this week, we've been looking at how we can impact our local community. And I'm trying to give you some, some... I'm trying to lift your heads a little bit. And I'm trying to challenge you a lot. Here's the thing. When Jesus saw situations, he said he was moved with compassion. Compassion. It doesn't feature on our card. We just realize it ought to. We're going to close by, if you, in some way, you, you want to respond, you don't know how to respond, or you feel you know what, I need some more compassion in my life. That's one of the cords that strengthens us. Compassion. Compassion makes us do some strange things. Have you ever thought about that? If you would like to respond this morning in some way, primarily about combat, if God is moving your heart in compassion for some of the things we've talked about, Okay, why don't we close our eyes? If you're a guest here this morning, don't worry. Nothing's expected of you. You can sit there and that's fine. But if you want to, I want to respond with, I want God's compassion in my life. Holy Spirit, you, right now, would you like to stand? If you know you need compassion, 
If you know that you want to get involved in some of the situations that have been talked about but don't know how, and you want to respond, you can stand as well. Jesus, we don't want to be people who just hear what you're saying and don't do anything about it. We want to be people who respond to you. So now, Holy Spirit, would you come and would you fill this room with your compassion? Would you break hearts as they think about situations that they're involved in right now, break people's hearts with compassion? Would you come with your compassion and sweep away cynicism? Would you sweep away judgment? Would you sweep away those things that we do like tick boxes in our heads? Would you sweep away the whole issues that arise from making wrong choices or whatever it is? Judgmentalism. Now come and break it with your compassion. Jesus, would you come right now? Bring your compassion. I pray, Father, out of this building this morning will run streams of living water. Let justice flow like rivers and mercy tumble down off the mountains. Bring your justice, Lord Jesus. Bring your mercy. Bring your grace. Lord Jesus, when we see situations, would you turn our hearts towards it and not our minds away from it? Jesus, come. Holy Spirit, come right now. Bring compassion. Now you know what it is that's in your heart. Just for a moment right now, why don't you speak it back to God? You know what God's spoken to you about this morning, last week and the week before. Why don't you just speak it back to God right now in the secret of your heart. If that means repenting, that's fine. Repentance is about turning to what God wants. Now make an agreement with God. Why don't you make an agreement? This is what I'm going to do. When Zacchaeus was caught up a tree and he found Jesus, it says that he gave away four times everything that he'd stolen. Repentance is an agreement. Why don't you make an agreement with God what you're going to do? We want to thank you, Lord Jesus, that you in your infinite power and wisdom could change everything just like that. But I want to thank you that you choose people like me for some bizarre reason to partner with you in changing this world around us. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you've asked us, you've asked me, you've asked others to put right what is wrong in this world. Amen.